Hi, I'm Dr. Blunt. This is my channel. We talk about philosophy, politics, and international affairs. And today we're starting a series that is going to touch on all three. We're going to be talking about republicanism. Now, if you want to stop a conversation in the elite liberal circles I move in, you say something like, I'm a Republican. That gets you that record scratch moment where people look at you like you're a Trump supporting proto fascist. But the fact of the matter is Republicanism is a centuries, if not millennia old tradition of thinking about politics, and it has pretty radical implications. In this series, I want to look at its grounding in an idea of freedom and how this influences its way of looking at politics and society. In order to understand why republicanism has had such a big revival in the 21st century, at least in universities, you have to understand how people were thinking about freedom in the 20th century. Specifically, you have to look at the works of Isaiah Berlin and his essay, Two Concepts of Liberty. Isaiah Berlin was a historian of ideas, a political philosopher, and a public intellectual. He thought that ideas have a profound effect on societies, that they can determine the trajectories of our political communities. And the idea of freedom is his most famous example of this. He says that there are two ways of thinking about freedom. One is commonsensical, and the other is extremely dangerous. Let's look at the dangerous one first. This dangerous conception of freedom is positive liberty. Now, the content of positive liberty is kind of difficult to get your hands on. Berlin writes about it in many different ways, but he basically says this. You are free when you have mastered yourself, when you are living authentically. And this is a very old way of thinking about freedom. In fact, you could take it all the way back to Plato. In fact, I have a funny Plato story. I know there are so many funny Plato stories. Dr. Blunt, I mean, please just tell me the funny Plato story. It is, it is actually a funny story. Plato, of course, is one of the most famous philosophers who's ever lived. He has this idea of a utopian political community in which philosophers are kings and kings are philosophers. But did you know that he actually tried to make a philosopher king? One of his friends was a relative of Dionysus II of Syracuse. And he was just like, well, Plato, why don't you come to Syracuse and we can make Dionysus into a philosopher king? And Plato's just like, yeah, man, that's going to be great. We're going to show up and we're going to make this guy so just that we're going to create a utopian society. So Plato shows up at the court of Dionysus. And the thing is, Dionysus kind of likes drinking, kind of likes sleeping around, kind of likes living that decadent tyrant lifestyle. I mean, who doesn't? Well, Plato doesn't. Plato starts saying, well, guys, have we thought about moderation? Chums, wouldn't it be nice to have some just laws? Friends, shouldn't we all just be temperate and kind and eat this wonderful porridge I've made. Eventually Dionysus gets bored of the constant lecturing from Plato and he decides to play a joke on Plato. Plato would go around saying, a just man is a free man. If your soul is balanced, if you have mastered your base desires, you are free and anyone can be free from the greatest king to the lowest slave. And Dionysus was just like, well, Let's see about that. Plato, you're a slave. I need a little bit of extra cash, so off you go into slavery. It's not going to bother him, though, because he's a just man, and a just man can be free no matter what. Now, don't worry. Plato's friends redeemed him from slavery, but it is a pretty funny joke, to be fair. There is an important lesson here, though. Freedom and the positive conception of liberty is often highly internal. It is about a state of your personality rather than external conditions. I mean, a lot of people associate the positive conception of freedom with the rise of Stoicism in the Roman Empire, because once the Roman Republic fell apart, people started to think, well, perhaps I can still be free on the inside, regardless of the political situation on the outside. The second conception of liberty is negative liberty. 
Berlin associates this with modernity. It comes about with the emergence of the modern nation state and capitalism and the scientific revolution, all of those things that have created the architecture of modernity are related to this idea of freedom. And it's pretty simple compared to the weird metaphysics around positive liberty. You are free in the negative sense if no one is interfering with you. Freedom is determined by the lack of interference, by what you can actually do. So let's have some examples, right? In a democracy, you are free if you can vote for whatever party you want. You can vote for the Republicans. You can vote for the Democrats. You can vote for the Communist Party of the United States of America. So long as no one is forcing you to vote one way, you are free. When it comes to consumer products, you go to the supermarket, you want to buy a pop. So you think, hey, I can buy a Coke or I can buy a Pepsi or I can buy whatever I want because no one's standing behind you with a bayonet being like, y'all better buy Mr. Pib or I'm going to shank you. You know, that is freedom of choice in the consumer context. If you have freedom of speech, you can say outrageous and offensive things and no one can stop you. I might say something like the clone saga in Spider-Man was actually really good. It had interesting themes and I really liked Ben Riley as a character. Now this might make you upset. You might find this to be deeply, deeply misguided, but there's nothing you can do about it. And if YouTube was to pull down those comments for obscenity, well, that would limit my freedom of expression. I would be less free because I'd be interfered with. So long as I am free from interference, I am free. It doesn't matter whether I'm living authentically, whether I've mastered myself, whether I'm living in sync with the laws of history. It simply means that I'm free from interference. That zone can be small. That zone can be large. All matters is that I'm not being interfered with. And there are stakes here. Berlin identifies positive freedom with the intellectual underpinnings of some of the worst disasters of the 20th century. The First World War was a product of nationalism, and nationalism believed that you are only free when you are embracing the national community. The Second World War was the product of Nazi ideology, which said that you are free when you are living within the race, right, to dominate the rest of the world. Communism, which dropped an iron curtain across Europe and over Asia, said that you are only free when you are living within the laws of history, that you are part of the proletarian revolution that would sweep away capitalism as historical materialism demands. Each of these produced millions of deaths. Berlin saw this as a fatal way of thinking about freedom. Negative freedom, on the other hand, he associated with liberal democracy, with the ability to live an unencumbered life without having to worry about the censor or the secret policeman spying on you or your neighbor informing on you. This is the freedom he associated with the democracies of the world. But we might want to ask whether this is the only way of thinking about negative liberty. And in order to answer that question, we got to zoom way back and look at the origins of this idea of freedom as non-interference. Now, I'm going to be drawing on the work of Quentin Skinner, specifically his book, Liberty Before Liberalism, which I actually really recommend as an excellent work of intellectual history that's highly readable to any of y'all out there who want to get into this topic a bit more. Now, what Skinner does in this book is look at the origins of negative liberty within the context of 17th century Britain. Now, this is an important insight into how we do the history of ideas. When we're taught, you know, things like Plato's Republic, Hobbes's Leviathan, uh, Mill's On Liberty, we are often taught that these are trans-historical ideas, ideas that apply regardless of where we live, or regardless of what time we exist in, that these guys have brains that are so big that they touch on permanent elements of the human condition. Now, look, there might be something to this, but the point that Skinner and other members of the Cambridge School of the History of Ideas make is that if you really want to understand the intent of the author, you have to understand the society in which they exist. So what's happening in 17th century Britain that is so interesting? Well, what's happening is civil war. 
The king and parliament have been fighting for years. It is bloody. It is brutal. They are beating the fuck out of each other. And Hobbes is on the side of the king. And he decides to write a book defending the king's right to rule. It's called, oh God, uh, uh, Leviathan. It's a big one. It's a really interesting book. And I would highly suggest you read it. Yeah, Leviathan, recommended by David Blunt. Leviathan is super famous for introducing the idea of the social contract. And, you know, rightfully so. But it also introduces the idea of freedom as non-interference. And you should be like, wait, that sounds kind of weird, Dr. Blunt. Because didn't Berlin say that freedom as non-interference is associated with liberal democracy, but Hobbes was this champion of autocracy? Well, that's one of the puzzles that Hobbes is trying to work out in Leviathan. How can he reconcile freedom with absolute monarchy? And his answer is that you're free when you're not being interfered with. It doesn't matter the character of the law or its origin. The law is the law. The government is the government. Democracy, autocracy, doesn't matter when it comes to freedom. Freedom is simply non-interference. You can live in a total dictatorship but if that dictator doesn't use his power for anything, you're free. You're not interfered with. So Hobbes is basically saying, if your concern is that the king is going to limit your freedom simply by being a king, you're an idiot. Because freedom is simply the absence of constraints. Why is Hobbes so concerned about liberty? right? Why does he think it's important to say that liberty and autocracy can be reconciled? Well, think about who he's writing against. The major intellectual forces behind Parliament are Republicans, and they say the mere presence of the king is enough to negate the liberty of all freeborn Englishmen. By reconciling freedom with autocracy, Hobbes is rejecting the mainstream of European thought since the Renaissance, where people said, you are free if you live in a free state. And they weren't referring to the nation state, they weren't referring to realizing some sort of true human existence. What they were referring to is a state in which there is no arbitrary power. Freedom for the individual is not merely the absence of interference, but the absence of arbitrary interference or domination. And this is what Skinner calls the third concept of liberty, freedom as non-domination. This idea of freedom as the absence of arbitrary interference or non-domination is the core, the bedrock of republicanism. And I'm going to tell you all about it in the next video. Thanks for watching. Take care, everyone.